Hey, good evening. And good evening to the web audience, wherever you may be. So the subject of this uh, of tonight's uh, talk is I like the name actually. Uh, hell. <laughs> hell two types of hell. Hell of ice and the hell of um, fire. In Hebrew in, ta in Talmudic sources and Kabbalistic sources we have the concept of a Gehenim which is the name for in Hebrew for hell. There's a Gehenim Shel Shelag, like a Gehenim, a hell of snow and ice. And there's Gehenim Shel Eish, a hell of fire. And uh, it's a topic I don't believe I've ever addressed, so some new material here. Though I think I, I, every week I try to add something new, and, but nevertheless, as themes go, I think it's not a theme that I haven't really uh, covered and the reason connected to why am I discussing it now, I mean, hell is not uh, focused only on one part of the year. You know, if someone's in hell, it could be any time of the year. Same with heaven. It's because these two chapters that we're going to be reading this week's and next, this is like a two-part series, um, actually struck me as I was reading them, is about, in a way, about um, ice and fire. We have this week's chapter is called Kairach. Kairach was an individual, a Levite, from the home, from the tribe of the Levites, which were the people who served in the temple. And he leads a rebellion against his own cousin, cousins Moses and Aaron. Right, the chapter begins Ve'ikach Kairach. The Kairach confronts leads an uprising and a rebellion against Moses. And it begins immediately the verse, of, you get the whole Yichas of Korach. Korach, the son of Yitzhak, the son of Kahos, the son of Levi. And together with him, he has a whole bunch of cohorts that conspire with him. And it says they rise up against Moses, 250 people that he instigated, and they said, why have you taken all this greatness for yourself? Too much greatness that you've taken for yourself. The entire nation is, sanct is sanctified. Because they all heard the Torah. They all stood at Mount Sinai. They're all children of God. And God rests among them. So why did you exalt yourself, elevate yourself above this community of God? Basically challenging the whole hierarchy and the uh, leadership of Moses. The next verse says that Moses, when he heard this, he fell on his face, so hurt by it. Um, the obvious reason is not because he was personally assaulted, but because he knew this was a rebellion not about him, because Moses was the humblest man. We just read a few chapters back. Moses was the humblest man. He never wanted this job in the first place. God had chosen him. Despite his arguments not to be the leader. And he realized what this is about. So it hurt him deeply. And the story goes on about the confrontation and what takes place. But the connection with um, hell is this. Karach, even though it's the name of an individual, but it also is pronounced and can have another meaning called Karach in Hebrew. It means ice. There's even somewhere a, uh, an expression that says Kerach Hagodol is like the great glacier, the great piece of ice. So Korach also has the meaning of uh, ice. And next week's chapter talks about fire. Right? The beginning of the chapter is the burning of the red heifer on the altar. It talks about the Srefus Hapara, the Aish, the fire that's used. So it struck me that these two chapters, in a way, talk about these two personality types, like archetypes. One is of ice and one is of fire. 
And that immediately elicits, as I mentioned earlier, that which the Talmud and we find in Jewish literature, the concept of Gehenim shal, Shalag and Gehenim Shal Eish, a hell made out of snow and one made out of fire. So I'd like to address this topic, especially in a more uh, personal personal sense of it. Because um, the focus I always do here at this class is not necessarily on the technical and um, commentaries that everybody can learn on their own, but more the personal application, because after everything is said and done, the only reason that why would we be following the Torah today, thousands of years after it was given, at Sinai, you know, all the characters and episodes and history of the Torah all happened thousands of years ago in a different part of the world, under different circumstances, completely distant from the modern world in which we live. So why is why should we be interested and intrigued by what the Torah has to say to us today? So some Jews, or more traditional, would argue because uh, that's what the God's Torah, and they just do so by uh, by rote, mechanically. That's what their parents taught them. That's how they've been programmed. So if some people may, that may be sufficient. If that's enough for them, so be it. But for people who did not grow up with it, or people who grew up with it but asked the question, why would I be interested in this Torah that has hundreds and hundreds of details, many of them that are absolutely not relevant even in any technical sense. Many, many laws in the Torah, for instance, uh, are not applicable today. There's only 86 mitzvahs, 86 positive mitzvahs that are applicable out of 248. That's a, a, a small number, a third. Why are they not applicable? Because many of them are connected, what's called Bizman Shabbat Samigda Shayakayim, they're connected to the time of the temple. And connected to the time of um, uh, the temple and the laws of purity and impurity and the offerings, which are not technically applicable today. Many laws are connected only in the time when Israel was was was, uh, was uh, free, and where most Jews lived in Israel, and so on and so forth. So, if you think of it, large body, large parts, large sections of the Torah, in any practical sense, are completely not applicable in any legal fashion. For example, we, the book of Leviticus, Vayikra, the third book of the Torah, most of it cannot be applied today in any practical way. And yet we say this entire body of Torah is called the Torah of our life. Torah is Chaim. Hi chayenu varachimenu. So clearly there's something missing because on a technical level it may not be practical. So how, we, how do we call this our sustenance? As I said, this is to me the greatest challenge of our time as Jews because the relevance, that key word relevance, how the Torah is relevant to us, is something that is really wanting in all communities, whether it's secular ones or non-secular ones. Even religious communities may be following Judaism, as I said, mechanically programmed, but to call it personally that you can open up a verse in the Torah and find it psychological and emotional and spiritual relevance to your life, you're not going to find many people who can do that. And when we have issues like that, issues in areas of relationships or uh, dealing with different uh, losses and trauma or issues between parents and children, all the psychological stuff that we all have to struggle with in one way or another, most people will go to therapists. First, they'll both go into denial, of course, but once they have to, they force themselves to deal with it, will not usually open up a Chumash or Bible or Torah or Talmud and look for answers because it's impossible to find them here. So once in a while you'll find inspiring verses in the Bible, but nevertheless on an ongoing basis you don't. like. So what's the relevance of this whole story of Korach to us? The man that rose up against Moses over 3,000 years ago, and then the story ended. He was wrong, he was proven wrong, and him and many of his cohorts were punished for it. So why do we need to know that they rose up against, you know, it's one thing if he had prevailed, so it's important to know. Why do we have to be told about a man that rebelled against Moses? You know, you could, if, if, even if the Torah wants to allude to it, it could have it simply said, 
Okay, there was a man that rose up and it was over with and then everything was clarified. But we get into every detail. You hear every argument of his. You know, usually, uh, if someone prevails in any historical sense of the word, you usually hear more details about the one who prevailed, not necessarily the arguments of the one who challenged. So why do we need to know about Korach's challenge when he was wrong at the end of the day? And that's also part of the Torah, even his question. When he challenges Moses, the hierarchy, he challenges the hierarchy that Moses and Aaron chose for themselves leadership, which is really a very quite contemporary challenge of challenging who's in charge, who's a leader, who's not a leader. In many ways, if you read Marx and you read socialist economic theory, it's the same question that was asked. Who created this hierarchy? Why are some more in control than others? So um, radical Marxism or radical socialist theory argues that there should be no private property altogether and all people should be treated equally economically and all the money should go into one large pot, so to speak, where there's no struggle of the classes, the class struggle of the middle class and lower class and upper class. So many, many people, intelligent people, were drawn to Marxist theories, including many Jews, because it was very appealing, it was very utopian. It was talking about a world where everybody would get as much as they need and there wouldn't be this inequality of uh, economic inequality that creates so much tension between those that have and those that don't have. And the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer and all of that. So in many ways, Korach's discussion with here and challenge of Moses is very applicable in that way. I actually once wrote a whole paper on this topic, but it's not so much a discussion for this evening. I'm just mentioning it. So the bottom line is, and this is the focus here, is what is the psychological and personal relevance of all these stories? In this case, the story of Korach. So the angle I'm going to discuss is, as I said, the outset to this evening, is the issue of the, quote, the two hells, the ice and the fire. Basically, it's two types of personalities. But before I get into that, I want to say this. Um, I think it's important first to define what does the word Gehenim and hell mean in the first place in Jewish uh, thought. What does it mean? So there are a lot of uh, myths and stereotypes about topics like is there a heaven, is there a hell? People believe in heaven and hell. Uh, what does it mean exactly? So in the most juvenile and childish approach, it's uh, what we're taught like the fairy tale descriptions of these two places. One is a place like a big candy store where you get all the uh, rewards. And another place is a burning uh, fer inferno where, uh, where those that go to purgatory burn in hell for their sins. And that's the way most of us were brought up. Some of us believe in it, some don't. But the first problem with that entire description of heaven and hell is, what are we talking about here, a physical place? You know, hell is described, you always see the images, looks like a big oven or a boiling pot or something like that. But are we talking about physical entities, physical environments? So different religions and different schools of thought have their version of it. I'm not going to go through every uh, description of heaven and hell. I'm going to focus on the Jewish description of heaven and hell. So here's a few, a few thoughts on this. Uh, number one, the Kotzka Rebbe once said, when he was asked about what, what is hell and what is heaven, he said hell is heaven for people who don't know that it's heaven. So it's like coming to a place that you can't appreciate because you don't know what it is. So that's called hell. In that context, the whole thing is a completely psychological one and a spiritual one, not in any context of an objective space that's called uh, purgatory or Gehenim or hell. The Rambam, when he defines Elam Haba, Elam Haba is a Hebrew word which means the world to come. Which we hear, this world and the world to come. Which again, in simple, lingu in simple uh, simplistic terms, it means here's where we live now. Today we, we act and behave in this world, and then tomorrow, meaning at the end of life, as we know it, we receive reward in Elam Hab in the next world, in the world to come. You hear that expression a lot, Elam Hab, the world to come. 
Maimonides says what it means, Elam Haba, in the book of in the Rambam, in Halacha, in his book of laws, Mishnah Torah, he writes that the Elam Haba simply means cause and effect. It's not a world to come as in time that it comes later. It's a result of what we build here. Which means our actions create our heaven. And obviously the opposite is also true. Our actions create our hell. So in that context, it's really not some type of objective place that you just dump somebody, you send this one this way and that one that way. It's really we create our futures, our destinies. And how we behave today will determine and define what will come tomorrow. But even these definitions are lacking because um, they ultimately all are not dealing with the most important thing of all, and that is what we call anthropomorphism, which means in simple English to apply physical attributes to spiritual ideas. To apply physical attributes to God is simply inappropriate. Not because of respect, but because you're talking about a completely different reality. And that's the key, key challenge whenever addressing any type of deeper reality. It's not so much how do you understand what kind of reality that is. It's more how do you get beyond your own limited perceptions, our own limited perceptions, with the tools that we have. So if we were to ask the question, what is reality? So most people on a very simple level, the simplest reality is what we experience with our five senses. I can touch see this table. So my two senses called touch and sight relate to this table. Then there are realities that we relate to with our ears, sound. So basically, sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell, the five senses, are the tools we use to define reality on this tangible world, this tangible world. So anything that fits those five things, if you've seen it, you heard it, you tasted it, you touched it, or you smelled it, you define it as some form of reality. Now, that's nice, but we know that it doesn't stop there. Because what about, like, let's say, um, a theory like 2 plus 2 equals 4? You can't taste, touch, smell, see, or hear it. So that's more of an idea. And we also know it's real because it's our ideas, our, our minds comprehend it. And what about something like love or pain? I don't mean physical pain. Emotional pain, anguish, anxiety. They don't, they're not fit into the criteria of the senses, but they're absolutely real. They, they're in many ways much more real than this table. Because this table, who really cares? When you're, when you're anguishing over something, you're agonizing, it affects you in a very profound way. So its effects are much deeper, and in a way much more real than many of the tangible things in our lives. And you start digging further and further, the question is, how far can you go? And what tools do we use? So the real, the real challenge in all these issues and this is the greatest challenge is we are so accustomed, I would say worse than accustomed, we're so um, programmed and hypnotized by sensory tools that it takes effort to get beyond your own senses to experience things that are beyond the senses. Which is why we have the constant battle. As much as you may understand that something is right or wrong for you, it still doesn't mean you're going to act on it. How often do you have a situation where you're tempted by something and you, and you know in your mind and your heart that it's not healthy. And even while you know, you still act on it. Because the power, the seductive power of material existence is so powerful that even if your mind and your heart tell you that on a spiritual level or on a deeper level, it's, not, it's, it's temporary, the pleasure. And it's not something that will be anything, nothing permanent about it. We still make mistakes. Just to show that even a person who is a completely spiritual human being not completely, nobody's a complete spiritual, but even someone who appreciates and doesn't need to work hard at relating to a higher reality that is not tangible is still seduced by this material world. And this is not a small challenge, it's a very profound one. And this is really the challenge in any discussion about heaven and hell as well. How can we relate to a heaven and hell when we're so, um, as I said, seduced and shaped by our sensory way of defining realities? So the classic example, I've given it many times here, is when everyone asks the question, where does the soul go to after death? Where am I going to go to after I die? That question. Or where did my father's soul go to after he died? I, mean, I hear this question so often. And it's a very basic question, a very uh, common one and an appropriate one in a way, 
because when you're connected to someone who you knew as a soul inside of a body, and then that person's soul departs the body, you want to know where it went. You want to know whether you can still connect to it. Does it see you? Even if you don't see it, you still have a relationship. And the day when, when we are, our souls go back to where they came from, will we reconnect to the souls of those that loved us and those that we love? Very fundamental questions for anyone going through that experience, but it's a, even for someone that hasn't, it's an intriguing question. So here's just so to show you how difficult it is, not difficult, the challenge to answer this question. The question itself is based on a very um, arrogant premise, you can say. The premise is this, I exist and I'm here. So my question is, where the soul goes to? As if you are where it's at, and where the soul goes to is like something that needs to be established. So I always use this, uh, it's almost ridiculous type of uh, imaginary conversation between, let's call it, electricity and a refrigerator. Or it can be with any appliance. So make believe there's a conversation going on between electricity and a refrigerator. And the refrigerator asks the electricity the following question. Where do you go? Where do you, the electricity, go once they pull the plug? Now, when the refrigerator is plugged in, so the energy is going in, electricity is energizing the refrigerator. The refrigerator is refrigerating and cooling food. The freezer is freezing the food or whatever you put into that box. So the refrigerator asks the, asks, the, asks the electricity, where do you go when they pull the plug? And I shut down, basically. And the electricity answers, very obviously answers, says, what kind of a chutzpah question is that exactly? What do you mean where I go? I've always been around. Where did you come from? You're a little box that was just invented in the last 100, 200 years. You asked me where I go. I was here long before you ever existed. And I just go back to my natural space, which is not occupying a space. Then in some way they figured out, humans figured out how to bottle me electricity and contain me in a box called a refrigerator. And now you think you own me. And, uh, and the question is, where do I go when, when the, they pull the plug? So in other words, what's happening here is the same you could say about the soul and the body. Our question, where, is, where does the soul go to, is assuming that we are where it's at. And this is reality. And since this is reality, it would be the equivalent of a child sitting in this room and doesn't know about anything outside of this room. And someone leaves the room and the child says, where did you go to? As if there's nothing that exists outside this room. There's a lot that exists outside this room. Except in a small mind. A small mind is unable to fathom it. So the same thing as on the material level. Just because we exist on this material world, this doesn't mean this is it. It means it's one piece of a big picture. And who knows how big that, big that picture is. We know today there's a conscious and there's an unconscious. What does the unconscious look like? And the unconscious is a lot vaster than the conscious. So there's much more that we don't know than we, we do know. Look, just take the human body, a six, five, six foot frame that weighs a few hundred pounds, 100, 200 pounds. Let's stop there. And um, with all our science and technology and medical breakthroughs, what do we know about this small body? So as much we know today that we didn't know, diseases have been conquered, life expectancy has gone up, many, many unbelievable breakthroughs in every area of medicine. Yet every good doctor will tell you, as much as we know, there's so much more we'll never know, or we, have, we don't know yet. There's mysteries. Take the mind, the brain, the small brain the size of a palm, the size of my palm like this, this size. 99% of this brain is completely untapped. No one has any clue how it works. And not because people are stupid or ignorant and so on, because the more you know, the more you see the vast, the vast uh, space, so to speak, that's beyond us. And that's only on a physical level, let alone a spiritual level. Like how will we understand? We understand this physical brain, when connected with the spinal cord to the body, is generating ideas, sy synapses, neurons are being fired and wired all the time. How many ideas can fit into your brain? Is there a limit? A million, a hundred million, a trillion? No one ever suggested that there's a limit. On a hard drive in a computer, there's a limit. You reach a certain point, there's no more memory. How much can a brain contain? No one knows. 
But there's something, because there's something that's not exactly tangible that the brain can generate. So just to give a few examples of what I'm going back to where I was at. So what do we know about the world outside of our box, outside of our refrigerator? Very, very little. We just know that there's something there. And we know that it enters into our box. We think this is where it's at. But if you're an intelligent person, you don't need to be very intelligent to understand it. But this is not where it's at. This is one little piece of a big picture. How big that picture is, humans cannot fathom. So the problem in talking about things like heaven and hell is the first problem is you have to, we have to get beyond our human language, the conventional language. Just like we talk about God, many people say, God, okay, I, my father was strong, my grandfather was even stronger, and God is stronger than all of them. So take all the strength of all the great p people in our lives, God is infinitely stronger. It's all using human references, which is anthropomorphism. So it's true, the Torah, Dibra Belashem Bnei Adam, the Torah speaks in the language of man. So we say God saw, God heard, God got angry, God yelled, whatever it may be. But those are just metaphors. The Torah says so itself. But because we're so accustomed to physical definitions, we apply them inappropriately on God, and we think that's exactly what God is. God is just more than we are. A lot more. It's not at all the case. That's what Abraham came to discover God. He came to realize he's not looking for a God that's an extension of himself. He's looking for a God that is the inner reality of all existence. And actually God has to find him, not he's going to find God. Because how could the part define the whole? If we are part of the reality, can the part ever define the, re the entire reality? So with this in mind, this introduction... Let's now go back to heaven and hell and define it a little more. Let's look at it this way. According to Jewish thought, every action we do releases an energy. I am using that word very deliberately. It releases energy. We're not just doing an act. You do a mitzvah. Mitzvah comes. The root of the word mitzvah is not commandment. It's from the word connection. The word Avera, which means sin, doesn't mean a sin. It means a disconnection. Mitzvah comes from Tzavsa, the Hebrew, the Hebrew root. And Avera comes from Havara, to move away from, to be displaced. So think of it this way. If life is like a machine, machines work a certain way. Certain things make the machine work better, and certain things make the machine work, break the machine. The Torah's body of laws is not just a bunch of laws that the God decided to think up of. The way we understand it is the blueprint of ex the, the, the cosmic engineer that put this machine into place called existence in our lives also gave us an operator's manual that tells us what makes this machine work and what doesn't make it work. Some of it we could understand, some of it we don't fully understand, but that's the essence of it. And when you study more, you understand more. And with that in mind, then every action we do for good or for bad, releases an energy. It could be a positive energy, it could be a negative energy. We're either connecting or we're disconnecting. That is why, what I said earlier, that we create our heaven. How we will behave in this world will be the, what the shapes, the building blocks, of what will come the rest of your existence. So like I said before, where does a soul go, go to after a person dies? A soul doesn't go anywhere. Soul never occupied space in the first place. A soul hovers on a spiritual plane that is hard for us to relate to because we're physical creatures. We think in terms of space and time in very structured ways. A soul is like, think of it like the electricity. It, so it lives on a different plane. Same place, but in a different plane. It's not somewhere you're going to travel millions of miles in outer space and you're going to meet heaven. You go to another place, you're going to meet hell. These entities exist right here, and all the souls are right here, right here in this room right now. But they're not here as we are here, because we're here on a limited material level. Like if I asked you the question, you know, if you turn on your cell phone, and you got on the phone, there's cellular um, vibrations in this room. You can't see them. How many subatomic particles right now are generating energy as we sit here in this room right now. No one can even imagine. It's impossible to imagine because it exists in a different dimension. How many atoms are in this table here? 
it's an infinite number because atoms are extremely microscopic, but they're very real. They define and shape reality. So in a sense, the idea of thinking of heaven and hell is really of thinking in terms of cause and effect, that our actions create energy, and our energy turns into something. The ultimate reward, we're told, is Mashiach's coming. The end of days, the Messiah will come to this world and bring peace to the world. And this too is understood absolutely in a very distorted, juvenile way. As if it's like, you know, like some retirement village. At the end of our work, we're going to, all re we're going to retire in a nice big golf course. And it'll be peace. Much more profound than that. We build the messianic reality right now. Each action a person does releases an energy that is forever and ever. How, for example, would you explain to your children this following, the following question? What really matter? Why would it really matter for me to be a good person when all of us at the end are going to die and we're all going to be eaten by the same worms? So who really cares? I don't mean to be so graphic. But who cares if you're a good person or not such a good person? What would we answer our children if they asked that question? What do we answer ourselves when that question is asked? So the conventional prerequisite answers you usually get are like this. It's just the right thing to do. It feels right to be good. God wants us to be good. We don't always understand it. We just, that's the way it is. I mean, a list, the list goes on. And I'm not saying those answers are, have no legitimacy at all. But frankly, if someone was a skeptic, then all those answers can be challenged. It feels good. What does that mean? And if somebody feels good by not doing something and helping others, then, then that's right. Okay, God wants us to be that way. Is there anything more to it than just God wanting? And what happens when a person dies? What happens to all the good deeds that they did? Only real answer to all these questions is that it doesn't die. The body may die. The soul never dies. The energy that we release through our deeds in this world forever change the world. Forever. Right? You hear that, Spencer? Forever. <clears throat> and therefore, the sacrifices that our parents and grandparents made from the beginning of time were not to naught. They didn't go to the graves with them. They, to use the example I'm using here, they put building blocks in place that when all of these building blocks would accumulate, it would change the existence. According to Jewish mysticism, the reason we live in a free world today, politically, and the reason there's such high level of technology, is not because people are smart and they figure it out after a while, is because the cumulative energy of good people for thousands of years has in a way refined and and um, and refined and elevated and transformed the material universe. To put it in more scientific terms, matter and energy is always the two forces that we try to connect. There was a time where matter and energy were two distinct worlds called a duality. Modern science has shown how, ma how matter and energy are really one. In the world of matter, for example, thousands of miles makes a difference. In the world of energy, you can get on a telephone or television and in a split second know what's going on millions of miles away. It transcends time and space. And when, they, when scientists figured out how to manipulate matter, that it should become conduits of energy, we have what we call technology. The mystics take it one step further and they say that's because good energy released by accumulation of millions and millions of good deeds over the years has pierced the layer of coarse materialism that allows energy to flow easier through this world. I mean, it's a very mind-blowing concept, but it's a very powerful idea. You don't have to accept it, but this is what I'm telling you what the mystics say. So the messianic world is a world where matter and energy converge to the point of total fusion. You know, Einstein put it this way, E equals MC squared. He said energy equals matter, basically. Today, that's not a mysterious thing. When he said it, it was a mind-blowing thing. People did not think of it that way. Today it's common. Our lives are controlled by invisible forces all the time. Look at every gadget you use. All technology is based on invisible energies. When I say invisible, I mean visible, invisible to our tools. So with that being said, the idea of a heaven and a hell, if you think of it that way, it takes on a whole different shape. It's not the kindergarten, nursery school version of heaven and hell, where you, you uh, purgatory of someone burns. It's a result of our behavior. Except in this world, we're limited vision. 
For example, would a, would a healthy human being put his hand in fire? Never. Because you know fire is, is going to damage you, going to hurt you. So then the question is asked by the mystics, if that's the case, why is it that we can hurt each other? Why can we do sin when we know that sin is the spiritual equivalent of putting your hand in fire? Because you don't feel it. That's the difference. We're not sensitive enough. It says in the books that we all human beings are part of one large organism. Specifically, let's say, the Jewish people. Yet we see we can hurt each other all the time. Is it conceivable, this is Talmud says, that the right hand should hit the left hand if it does something wrong? Would your body start hitting itself? We know that's, that's, a, that's an autoimmune disease that's terrible. So even if you knew you did something wrong, would you go ahead and beat yourself up physically? Some people would, but generally we don't do it. Why? Because it's all part of you. My left hand is part of my right hand. And it doesn't matter. So why is it, they ask the question, that when we, as human beings, why is it so easy for us to hurt another person? If that person is part of us, the answer is you don't feel it. You're blind. That's exactly what the Talmud says. Ein Adam means a person would not sin unless they had a moment of insanity. What kind of statement is that? A person sins because they're tempted, seduced, attracted to something. The Talmud doesn't say that. The Talmud says a person would not sin unless they have a moment of basically blind insanity. That's not a legal claim, by the way. We can't use that. But spiritually it is, in a sense, not a, not a claim. The reason for it is because you would never be able to put your hand in fire. You would never be able to really sin if you saw its impact, if its consequences. So the fascinating thing is God concealed the consequences of our behavior, which is why we can do whatever we want and think there's no consequences or delude ourselves that the consequences are not what, they, what we'd like them to be. So the physical world and nature cause and effect control our lives. A healthy human being will not put their hand in fire and will not do anything else that's Directly destructive. Actually, I should qualify that. That's not really true. Because look at every cigarette box. That, well, look what it says there. And people are smoking. So you could have a box that says, smoking kills. And people just enjoy the smoke. So either they don't believe the, the statement. Or they minimize it. And they think, right now, my pleasure. You know, it's not killing me now. <clears throat> and the same thing with other behavior. We may know certain things are destructive. We still do it. But on a spiritual level, it's predominant because we don't know what it looks like. We don't know the impact of our behavior. If you knew the impact of, of you insulting or hurting somebody that you consider your enemy, and you knew that it damaged you directly, it would be a whole different picture. As I said, you still may do it because we have, we're blinded. But the point is that we don't see the consequences of our behavior. Basically, we don't see the heaven and the hell that we create. There's an expression, that you will see your world in your lifetime. It's considered a blessing that you will have heaven in this world, heaven on earth. You could also deter define it in a negative way. You'll have hell on earth. So heaven and hell, the spiritual concepts of heaven and hell are actually directly cause and effect of our behavior. This is a long introduction to what I want to get to about the two types of hell, which is the theme here. Hell of ice and the hell of fire. I just like the, the type. It's kind of cute, especially if you're not there. You know. Um, so there are two types of personalities. Whether it's genetic and hereditary or it's acquired, we'll discuss soon. When somebody hurts you, Somebody offends you, especially someone you love or someone that loves you. How do you react? So there are people who close down and become detached and cold, silent, silent treatment. You ever been at the other end of the silent treatment? Someone you care about? It's not so pleasant, right? I'm sure if you're giving someone a silent treatment, remember it's also not so pleasant. And then there are people who the other the other extreme. When something confronts them, they get all fired up. 
and they get very heated and can get very angry, and they're very expressive. Doesn't always mean they're vocal. You know, some people just shut down and just detach, and some people seethe inside. Why, why do some people react this way, some this way? So, obviously, there's a lot of factors involved, many factors involved, in which includes some of us are born hot-blooded and some are born cold-blooded. You hear about cold-blooded people, sometimes cold-blooded bastards is what they call it. And then you have hot-blooded people. Is this purely genetic? Let, let's, let's begin with being genetic. There are families. You could see a trend in a family where parents or grandparents, you see a certain, uh, certain pattern that people react a certain way. That still doesn't mean it's hereditary. It could still be something you grew up with. For example, many, many people who use anger as a tool or they think it's a tool is because they saw anger used in their lives. If you saw, you grew up in a home where a parent or two parents were angry and expressed anger, and that's how they, you as a child perceived how they were dealing, coping with issues. Not that they were coping, but they were, but you think they were. Usually it will impact that you will also be that way. Anger can usually be traced to something you grew up with. That doesn't mean always that way. There are people, for example, growing up in very peaceful homes and still very angry because you can be angry at other things that happen in your lifetime especially in your childhood, that caused that anger. But I'm not here to analyze every, every root and every aspect of what causes people to be angry, why some people have this uncontrollable rage for a small little thing where another person will not, never have rage over that, which clearly means it's, it's in your control. Because it's not like an objective thing that every human being is going to get angry at the same thing. You see, that's not the case. People who are angry by nature usually get angry about a lot of things. People who are not angry by nature just simply don't. Not because of the crime. It's about you. It's how you cope, how you react. You know, that alone, by the way, is enough, is a message that, that, that is extremely valuable to know that it's not about, which what most angry people will always blame the other. You know, all the battered wife syndrome, for example, is all about that. It's about, what did I do wrong? The person who, who did the crime is never wrong. So they were provoked. That answer you always get. Oh, if I didn't provoke him, he wouldn't be so angry. That's complete baloney. person gets angry, I don't care how bad the crime is. Listen, the Germans did plenty to the Jews and caused plenty of anger. Yet the Jews don't go up and blow up cafes in Germany as a result of revenge. Our revenge is we'll rebuild our lives and we'll have greater families and we'll come back to Berlin and march Hanukkah with a Hanukkah menorah in the Berlin center of the city. So that's also a way of channeling your anger. So it doesn't mean that we have nothing to be angry about. But there's different ways to react. So in other words, it's not about what shape it takes. So going back to this cold-blooded, hot-blooded, so there are factors, different factors that cause us to react different ways. Usually it can be identified with what you saw in your life by the people that most shape your early life. In other words, in our impressionable years as children, how we saw our mother and father react to situations usually cause us to react similarly, whether we know it or not. So if our mother would shut down and give our fathers the cold, silent treatment and cold, it's usually a method that you begin to uh, assume and adapt in your own life. And if it's the other way around, anger, or I, I mean that's one way, it could also be from the father to the mother. These are forces that shape us. And they're very profound because even if it's not genetic, this doesn't mean it's easy to change. Because as many point out today, nature and nurture Nurture can become almost as powerful as nature. If you've been nurtured a certain way from a very young age, it almost shapes you as if you were born that way. And it's as difficult to change that pattern of behavior as if you were born with it. Maybe not exactly as difficult, but very, very close to it. Besides for the fact that you, in the early years, uh, get defined by your behavior, it's also because the neurons in the human body, in the human mind, get reshaped. If you start developing a certain reaction to things, you, your actual system, your whole physical physiology can get reshaped according to that system, even though you weren't born that way. So without going to unnecessary elaboration on this topic, so when we talk about the different ways we react to things, the concept of the heaven, the hell of ice, or the hell of fire, 
even though on one hand you could think of it as an objective reality, is very much the hell that we create in our lives. Rage, fiery reactions, creates a hell called a hell of fire. Coldness and detachment and silent treatments creates a hell of ice. Both are unhealthy, period. That's the first thing we have to know. Now, you could say, so why? Well, how should we react? How should we react? Well, why do you think somebody detaches? Since we're talking this week about kerach, ice, kerach. Why do you think somebody detaches when, uh, when they're hurt or they're offended? Is it because of a, is it a punishment? Are they getting even? Or is it something else? Well, usually, usually detachment is a result of um, fear. You can say detachment is fear, which means you're afraid of getting too hurt. So what you do is disconnect before you get too hurt. This is very common. It's not the only rule. I'll, I'll discuss some others as well. But detachment can be a very result of fear. It's like, look, think of uh, those, those creatures, those animals, like a uh, turtle. Fear is afraid, its head will right, go right back into its shell. You know, we have the ability psychologically to put up a wall or walls to protect our inner layers. They say the porcupine has the softest skin of all creatures on this earth. So that's why it was blessed with these sharp needles to protect it because the underbelly of the porcupine is extremely, extremely sensitive. So you can argue psychologically that detachment is really a way of protecting ourselves. So per se, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's the way that's called an immune system. You're being hurt. You're going to do something to protect yourself. However, you're in a relationship with somebody. What are the consequences of this? Does that mean that you cannot be vulnerable with that person, so you have to shut down, you have to detach? So this is an analysis of what it means to be cold and detached. Here you have the story of Korach. I feel awkward in this silence. So, you have the story of Korach. And maybe this is what ex explains why he was called by this name. So Korach challenges, he was a great man, they say. Pika he was also a very wise man. And he came from royalty. He was from the tribe of Levi. He was not downtrodden. And yet of all people, he's the one that comes and challenges Moses about leadership. Which seems odd. If he was from the lower class, you could say he's coming to, to rebel. But he, if, if every challenge he has to Moses is a challenge about him too. If, if Moses is not a leader, then he, 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 neither should he be. And there are many, many questions asked about Korach's intentions. What was he thinking? I mean, he was not, as I said, he was a wise man. He wasn't stupid. So what was he thinking? That Moses won't be the leader. He'll be the leader. And then what? The same arguments he's giving to Moses applied to him too. He's saying, all the people are holy. Why did you rise yourself above them? So what did Korach exactly want? He himself was one of those above. Not on the level of Moses, but he was a Levite, a leader, and so on. And the whole challenge of Moses in general, he knew what it says in the Torah two chapters earlier, that Moses was the humblest man that ever walked on earth. He knew that Moses was chosen by God, and Moses refused initially to take the Jews out of Egypt, Mount Sinai, to lead the Jews through the wilderness. So the whole episode is very strange. There are many, many explanations given for it. But there's another place in the Torah where it's not quite spelled the same way. It says, Asher Korach Abadach talks about Amalek. Amalek. <coughs> Amalek is uh, the arch enemy of the Jewish people. Psychologically, Amalek is the power of doubt. You know, when you're convinced of something, you're passionate about something. So Amalek, it says, as soon as the Jews came out of Egypt and they were so inspired, Asher Abadach. Amalek came and he cooled off their inspiration. Cool. He says, you know, take it easy, don't get so excited. Amalek is the gematria, the same numerical equivalent of Suffolk, the throne of doubt. It's like when you're all excited and passionate about something and someone comes and gives you that, you know, yawn and makes you pour cold water on your excitement. In many ways, that's like one of the worst things possible because you're already inspired. And someone says, eh, don't get so inspired. 
to the people before you, you know, because that, that, that kills the, the energy that we all have. We all have these types of energy. This doesn't mean that we, can't be, we shouldn't be realistic, but it means that it's a real enemy, that type of doubt. Sometimes the intellect is called a cold, the cold brain, cold mind. So for all the beauty and the value of mind and, and, uh, and, the, and cerebral cognitive skills, what it also has does not have passion. The mind has no passion. It's the heart that has passion, emotions. So in a healthy structure, the mind measures and tempers the passion of a heart. So we shouldn't go overboard or we shouldn't get caught up and be uh, misled, emotionally manipulated. But imagine a mind that so cools off every time you have passion, that you no longer, uh, that it basically turns you into a cold person. Because the mind is cold intellect. It will analyze and process and give you the results. It cannot tell you love or don't love. The mind can say there are good reasons to love this person. There are good qualities. But the actual love is an emotional reaction. So emotions is where heat and cold come from. But the mind, by nature itself, is a very cold force. Which sometimes one Hasidic Rebbe once called it, is nothing as dead like the mind. Because it, dead, it can deaden something. If you overanalyze something, you can de- overanalyze it to death. You can kill any passion if you start intellectualizing it. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't use our minds to analyze and process and make sure it's a correct conclusion. But no, never let your mind become the final uh, arbiter. It's a process. It's like research. Let the mind do its research, but it's not the final decision maker. So the captain of the ship may be the mind, but it's not the ship. You need to live your life. So in a healthy relationship, your mind checks out to make sure you're not getting caught up in the wrong relationship. It shouldn't be dysfunctional. It should be balanced. But a mind, after all, is an excellent computer. You want a computer deciding whether you should love or shouldn't love in this world. So in that sense, what Kairach was, precisely because he was a Pikach, he was so smart, it says Pikach Chaya. Pikach is more than just smart. Pikach is like shrewd, very savvy. He was a, precisely because he was so smart, that was his undoing. Because his challenge was very legitimate, which is why the Torah documents. It's a very good challenge. He's a very good argument. He says, all the nation are holy. God rests among them. And why did you, Moses that is, and Aaron, your brother, Tisnasu, Exalt yourself and lift yourself up above everybody. As I said earlier, I don't want to compare Karach to Marx, but this is the argument of all great thinkers of hierarchy. Why is there a hierarchy in the first place? Can we all speak directly to God? We need an intermediary. In Judaism, there's no such thing as intermediaries. So Karach was pretty smart. He was asking a very important question here. We all could connect to God. Everybody stood at Mount Sinai. So why did you lift yourself up? And he used his mind to kill the whole idea. And what is the ultimate answer to this question? So Korach, before we get to the answer, was basically um, challenging with his mind, very similar, and you can't compare Korach to Amalek, because Amalek is a true Russia. Korach, they say in the Shpol Zedi, he's called Korach, is the Helik Zedi Korach, his holy grandfather. So Korach was a holy man in many ways. Though here, he made a mistake, but his mistake was not ungrounded. There was a lot of basis for it. Rashi, the other commentaries explained that Korach Meh's mistake was he saw greatness for his family, but his mistake was it wasn't him to come generations later. But regardless of the explanations, the bottom line is he challenged something here. And what the answer to his question? The answer to his question is it's true. Nobody ever disagreed that all of us are not equal in the eyes of God. The difference, however, is that some people have refined themselves to the point where they're not intermediaries, but they're people that we turn to because they can be role models. So to say, for example, get rid of the whole hierarchy and leadership. Yes, if Moses was driven by ego and by power, then Korach was right. But if Moses is the humblest person chosen by God, Moses was not about controlling people. It was about being an example of what a godly person in this world is like. So most of us, even though, as I said, all of us are connected directly to God, the difference is there's some people who have worked harder and refined themselves, and the rest of us 
are consumed with our material concerns. And that's why you need leaders from a Torah perspective. Not because they're smarter than us. It's because we are sometimes distracted by the by daily day life. Now that requires more than just wisdom. That requires a whole true commitment relationship. You see, from Carl's point of view, intellectually speaking, they're all equal. Who cares? But he wasn't thinking like a leader. He wasn't thinking like, how do you create a system? Because in that case, little children too are equal. We all have souls. So why should children be educated by their parents? And why should children go to school? We all have souls and we connect directly to God. The answer is because the soul comes down into a physical body, into a physical world, and it doesn't have the knowledge and direction and natural inclination to be a refined person. So it needs good role models and teachers. Not because those teachers are closer to God, but because those teachers or those mentors have refined themselves to the point where they can be a role model, an example. And Korach, in his cold wisdom, wanted to cool all that off and dismiss it all, forgetting about the big picture. And we need to know the story because we need to know about a Korach. We need to know his arguments. It's not just about who won here. His arguments have value. Even today, his arguments have value and they have merit. But at the end of the day, as Moses turns to God and God says, puts the whole thing to the test, it comes down to, yes, creating a system that works. So many lessons in this about leadership, about ego, about pride and all that. But above all, what's relevant to our discussion here was the end of the story is Korach and his cohort end up getting swallowed by the earth. They go into their hell, swallowed by the earth. The question is, why, by the, why were they swallowed by the earth? What kind of punishment is that? So there's an expression that we read in the previous chapter that says when the scouts went into Israel, they came back with this terrible report, and they used this expression. They said, Eretz Echeles Yishvel, the land that consumes its inhabitants. Because they saw materialism as being a force that consumes us all. Like who hasn't compromised? I discussed it last week at length. Who hasn't compromised their own uh, higher values because of the pressures of marketplace? All of us. Think back to your idealism when you were a little younger. It can be quite sad. So the scouts came back and said, listen, we don't want to go into a materialistic world. It consumes its inhabitants. It's a land that consumes its inhabitants. When Korah heard that, so he jumped on that and he said, they're absolutely right. I mean, and I'm sorry, they, they were, they're wrong. and That's why they were punished. We do have to go into this land. But Korah went to the other extreme. He said, we all here on this earth are equal and we don't need necessarily any spiritual uh, connectors, any leaders. So he went to the other extreme. The scouts wanted to remain in, us in a spiritual environment and not enter into the material world. Korach said, we could be in the material world and we don't need any leaders. We're all equals. Now what happened when Marx and then later communism took over, despite the utopian vision that that economic model offered, which was that all people would be equal. No matter how much you make, all the money would go into one collective pot. And then that money would be distributed equally to, uh, to how much a person would need, each according to their needs. That's the essence of communist thinking, of, of Marxist economy. No private property. The entire world would be a communist revolution that would change the entire world. And it would be a, basically a messianic world, a utopian world, as I said earlier, which was why it was so appealing. One little problem. It didn't take into account human nature. It's very nice, these theories. So the big question in communist, if you read the, 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 the economics of it, was what happens in this transition period? Okay, right now, let's say in 1850, um, you have people owning property, you have really wealthy people, you have kings, whatever it is. We're going to make sure that all that property is taken away from them, all the money is taken. We, who's going to hold it until we have this collective pot? And who's going to distribute it? And who's going to decide? Remember, communism also has no need for God. So who's going to decide? So in communist thinking, Marxist thinking, there'd be so-called these public servants who would be take, caretakers over, over this money and property until 
the day would come when communism would control the entire world. Well, that's where it all got screwed up. Because in the name of creating equality among the masses, and among the classes, it, it created the biggest abuse of individual power, even more than anything capitalism or democracy has ever created. Because then people like Stalin, and a milder level Lenin before him, Stalin exercised this control, took control of everything in Russia, and millions and millions of people died, all in the name of this future communist revolution. And he became the single power that owned it all. Exact opposite of Marxist theory that there's no one individual that owns anything. Because that's human nature. Power corrupts. And there's no such thing as a transition period. As soon as you give anybody control of the cookie jar, they're going to become the abusers. So everything Marx writes about in his economic theories about the abuse of power, the alienation of workers and, and all the, that comes in the world of capitalism, happened much worse in the world of communism because then it was, the power was completely controlled by one or two people, usually one. Why am I saying it is because in the name of equality, you end up destroying the universe too. So though it's true that all people are equal, that doesn't mean all people have earned their right to lead. And not everybody has earned their right to be a teacher. It means that all of us have souls and our souls are equal in the eyes of God. But actualizing a soul and having one is not the same thing. So Korach was arguing this cold-blooded um, cold blooded approach to existence as everything being equal. And what is his punishment? He's consumed by what he gave so much power to. What happens to him, what the Maragdim, the Scots were afraid of, a land that consumes its inhabitants, is literally what happens to Korach. The land that he so worshipped consumes him and his cohorts. This is what happens when, uh, this is the so-called cause and effect of the cold as ice approach. So let's apply it more to our personal lives. Oh. There will be people in your life that are going to inspire you. There will be experiences that will be inspiring. And it's very easy that another voice will come in and say, hey, don't take it so seriously, cool down. The voice that kills passion, the doubts, and so on. So everybody's got a kairach, a kerach, ice inside of them. When it comes to personal relationships, as I said before, some of us detach, um, some of us get cold, and ultimately, even though we may be protecting ourselves from others, you mentioned before detachment could also come from a healthy place, which is like... Um, uh, type of not, not, want to, not wanting to be involved in something that's unhealthy. But ultimately, it's like a common story. I, I deal with it. I just dealt with it recently. People who have been hurt very deeply in relationships usually shut down on a certain level. They don't want to be hurt again. Some give up on relationships. Some say, I'll never really find somebody because I've already been there. I don't want to be hurt again. <clears throat> Many people who grew up in very dysfunctional homes, like children who grew up in dysfunctional homes, there are some that don't, do not want to build families. They don't want to bring children into this world and do to them that was done to, what was done, do, do to these children what was done to them as children. I mean, I've heard this. What happens is, because you've been hurt, you create a cold, detached attitude, which may protect you, but it doesn't necessarily make you healthier. And as a result, what happens is you become a product of your own coldness. Because the one that suffers most ultimately is yourself. A person who's unable to really fully celebrate life, fully come out of their shell because they've been hurt. We all have elements of that. Everybody does. But you have to remember, it's not just about others, it's about yourself. Which is why, as I said, heaven and hell are completely defined by who we are and what we do. We create our hells. That's the bottom line doesn't come from any objective place. You create it. Your actions, your attitudes, your behavior creates your hell. But the good news is that you also create your heaven. Those of us that get beyond the fear and allow ourselves to be vulnerable and don't just uh, cut off to the point you cannot, don't, do not return, learn to build a heaven as well that comes out of that. 
So there's a uh, challenge that each of us has in our attitudes. Yes, some of us are hot-blooded, some of us are cold-blooded. Here's like a suggested thing. Now, I don't know how many of you like like uh, hot food. Anybody here likes hot food? Like, uh, you know, spicy hot food? Yeah, you do? So you think that people who like hot, spicy food are either Sephardic, Mexican, or um, just hot-blooded creatures. But let me tell you a little surprise. It may be the exact opposite. There's a there's a uh, there's an interesting thought. If you look at the difference between music of the East and music of the West, or more specifically, called Arab, Muslim, or even Sephardic music, more from the East, and Western music like uh, European, Russian, and so on, you find a general key distinction. Most uh, Arabic music is very very melancholy, very sounds like wailing, almost like a cry. Across the board, even their so-called Lebedic, even their lively songs, are, have a certain wailing element to them. In Western music, most of it is very upbeat. Western music includes rock and roll and music we know, contemporary music. Some Eastern music has seeped into Western music, but let me see, but generally those are the two distinctions. One is very, very much more like a melancholy, uh, wailing, sadder tones, almost like crying out. Another is very upbeat. So there's an interesting statement from a great mystic called the Balatanya. He writes like this. He says, the Baal Shem Tov says, that tainuk t'midi ain't a tainuk. Ongoing pleasure is not pleasure. Pleasure is always from novelty, from something new. You have something, you get too accustomed to it, you're not going to have pleasure from it. You may still love it, you may still care for it, but pleasure comes from something unique. Something that becomes too common, it's very hard to have pleasure in it. <clears throat> so he explains the following. Ishmael, which is the Muslim Arab world, the Eastern world, comes from Abraham, is the son of Abraham. Abraham was chesed. Chesed, love, is very upbeat. So the music which brings pleasure comes from the opposite extreme, Gvura, which is very sad, sadder type of music. In other words, souls that are very upbeat need uh, sadder music to make them happy. And the opposite is also true. The Western world comes from Esau, the son of Isaac, which is Gvura. So its pleasure comes from the opposite, which is uh, upbeat songs. So you could argue and say that people who like hot foods really have very cold-blooded souls, and it's the hat that, like, so-called counters it. I'm not saying about that, about you, Spencer. Okay? And maybe the opposite is also true, that people, I mean, sometimes you say opposites attract, sometimes they repel. There's no real rule about it in marriage or in relationships. But there's definitely something to be said that the counter force, when a person is extremely hot-blooded, they don't need hot food because they have it ready naturally. What they need is something to cool them off, so to speak. And people who are cold-blooded, they don't need the, the cold type of experience. They need something that's hot to counter that element in them. And the same thing is in personality, psychologically speaking. Not that it's a rule, but it's an interesting concept that if you are a cold person, you know that last scene in Zorba the Greek, where you get the, gold, the cold Englishman asks Zorba to dance, to teach him how to dance. You know, people who are very cerebral and very intellectual often can let go. They can't let go. They can dance, sing. Free abandon is usually not in the domain of people who are too cerebral because they're always in control and everything is calculated. But it's the healthiest thing for them to let go because it releases a whole other energy. And, uh, and, and the opposite is also true. People who are the opposite extreme, who are very, um, called, gregarious and open, very extroverts, their uh, healthy balance is to find some place where they go to that's more introverted, a little more quieter. The bottom line is extremes are never healthy. Maimonides says, always take the middle path. If you've gone too far to the right, you may need to go to the, other, to the left to get back straight, like when you're driving. If you've gone too far to the right, the only way to get back is not to, go, to keep going straight. You've got to uh, veer to the left to get it back to the middle. Psychologically, the middle path is balance. Extremes are never healthy. 
So the idea of, of, uh, of ice and heat, we'll talk about heat more next week, which is a hotter topic, no pun intended. But uh, icy cold personalities are usually a result of somebody that is afraid, detached, and protecting themselves. It's usually the sign of it. It's not just because a person has a great mind. Sometimes it's the other way around. A very uh, wounded heart will develop a great mind to protect itself. How is it? Churchill put it this way. He said that uh, in times of war, the truth is so precious, you have to protect it with an army of lies. Which is why you know misinformation is so critical in time of war. Uh, you have to constantly protect the truth with a whole army of lies. I'm not suggesting that is what's necessary here, but the point of the matter is that the most sensitive parts of a person are the parts where we usually build armor and, uh, and, uh, and uh, other protective forces. So you know the oyster, natural pearls, you know where they come from, right? A natural pearl is the secretion of an oyster that is a piece of dust has entered into its very sensitive in, innards, sensitive skin. So a piece of dust enters into an oyster. What an oyster does is it secretes a certain cream-like uh, substance that hardens in order to protect it from the dust. And that hardened um, secretion is a pearl. So oyster pearls. Those are the pearls are actually a, a product of an irritated oyster, if you want to put it that way. So things we value are interesting, how they become value, pearls, and uh, so on. Same thing is with diamonds. These are all built on, based on underground pressures, always coming out of a result of usually a, of intensity that's not always coming from a healthy place originally. So the idea psychologically of kerach or kerach or of um, a hell of ice is to look at ourselves and, um, and how we have our own detachments. Some of us in the need of control will always remain detached in a certain way. We may know how to fake it. You can fake plenty of attachments. But you always reserve a back door out because you don't want to get hurt. You don't want to get hurt. But the truth is relationships is the best way to describe a, a healthy relationship is a celebration of uh, vulnerability. It's a celebration of vulnerability. And the cold attitudes that we have are actually undermine not just relationships with another, with a relationship with yourself. Because you, do, you don't go into, you won't go into, and are afraid to go enter into the deeper parts of your personality. Korach was, as I said, a brilliant guy. But his big grave mistake was he did not appreciate what leadership really is. You see, because a man like Moses was not about being in power. It was about sensitivity. He was the ultimate sensitive human being. Korach could, not be, could no longer be trusted as a leader because his whole point was he, he saw power struggles. He saw Moses as he saw himself. It's about who's going to be in control. It's not about control. It's about sensitivity. Ultimately, Moses' great power was his sensitivity. Sensitivity, when they say Moses was a shepherd, because he was sensitive to the sheep. And God says, I choose my leaders by how they treat sheep. King David was the same. When Moses was tending to the sheep of Yisrael, and one sheep went wandered off, and he, um, and he pursued the sheep. You think, among thousands of sheep in, the, in this flock, so one sheep is missing, so what? How did he even notice? But he noticed, and he came running after the sheep. He found the sheep standing by a brook of water, trying to sip some water. So he realized the sheep was thirsty, and he felt bad, so he carried the sheep back on his shoulders to the flock. Nobody was watching. The owner of Yisrael would never have known. So God said at that moment, if that's how a man treats sheep, one sheep, and so sensitive, he's the person I want to be the shepherd of my people. So this is the first time Moses is describing the Torah. You'll say, Moshe HaYeroye. That's his first description of shepherd. You know, we have many rabbis today and many heads of institutions and organizations. But I don't know how many shepherds we have. You know, I'm not trying to be negative, but... That's what it comes down to. The Moshe, as a Moshe Rabbeinu, was ultimately a sensitive soul. And he responded to souls that way. That is the essence of Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu's leadership. Yes, he was wise and he was a scholar and he received the Torah. 
But that's what he was. He was a sensitive soul. But ultra-sensitive. And that's who God entrusted his people with. Korach was a brain. I'm sure that Moses Moshe was also a bigger brain than Korach, but Korach was only a brain. And lacking the, the sensitivity. So it was cold. A cold man. And, and leadership, life, is not about the mind. The mind is critical to process, as I said, to analyze. But the, heart, the, the life plays itself out in the world of the heart. And that's why the idea of coldness, kerach, kerach, ice, is always considered to be, in the words of the Kabbalist, klipa. It comes from a negative place. It never has positive results. Sometimes you need it to protect for temporary, but it's never a place. Warmth is always a symbol of life. Cold is a symbol of death. <coughs> Lifelessness. So the cold mind is a lifeless force. It's a lifeless force that has a lot of power in it, but it ultimately should not be the controlling force. In many ways, what has happened, for example, with the Enlightenment in the battle between science and religion, and for all the downside of religion and all its corruption and abuse and so on, but the other extreme that happened, that science, reason, became the new god, is equally, if not more, destructive. Because what, what happened was the cold mind became the force that controls life. When you talk about God and talk about faith, there's no way you can only approach it from an intellectual way. You know, the whole idea of trying to prove God exists with your mind, for every proof God exists is a proof that God doesn't exist. God created an agnostic universe. It's very easy to deny God's existence. If you want to appreciate God and want to appreciate life, you have to enter the domain of the heart. And I'm not saying an uninformed heart. It has to be an informed heart. But life plays itself out in relationships. Relationships are emotional. When we were young children, everything is about our emotions. Then we develop minds, which are healthy, to, as I said, to guide us. But if the mind replaces the heart, the mind becomes the new God, you have a world that is completely cold, indifferent. You, know, you meet professors, intellectuals. Some of them are, are like the worst people you'll ever meet in your life. Even though they're so brilliant and they're shaping the minds of our youth, they are, but they, they, they have no hearts. They've gotten disconnected from their hearts. I'm not saying this as across the board, not everybody's the same, but there's a certain element of a lack of sensitivity. Talk to them about emotional intelligence. How do you talk to somebody? Yeah, so they can give you a whole rundown intellectually, and they hide behind their minds and don't have the ability to just have a, a warm communication, which, in my, in my, from my opinion, education is much more about warmth and love than it is about intellect. Because the, that that, the words that come from the heart enter the heart, and a teacher that speaks to your heart is going to change your life. A teacher that speaks to your mind may blow you away and may give you great ideas, but they'll never change your life. Because life plays itself out on the heart level. So we have this paradox of mind and heart, cold and warm, and then we need to balance the two. Unfortunately, we live in a world of extremes. It's either one or the other. And that's where all the troubles come. So we have here a chapter that helps us focus on this part of ourselves, you know, you're cold. You're, are you cold or you're warm? Are you hot? Many people, as I said, fluctuate from the two, two extremes. To be somewhere in between where you can access and you can, at, at will, access both warmth and cold, knowing each circumstance, what, what is necessary, is a healthy human being. In other words, fear is not the driving force. It's what is correct is the driving force. So there are times where we do need to be cold and detached and analyze something. But there's a time where we need to be warm and hot and passionate and connect to it and not just remain detached. It's a process. A process. It's like any intellectual process. First you absorb research ideas, absorb knowledge, and then comes a point where you, uh, pro where you uh, process it and you have to come to a decision. Decisions are never purely intellectual. Every decision that a human being makes is, it has some emotional element to it. However, you want that emotion to be informed by the intellect. There's going to be an emotion. You're going to have a gut instinct. Or like, why, you know, why go this way, that way? Yeah, there'll definitely be paths that your mind told you is definitely not way, the way to go. But when it comes down to it, investing here, should I invest here or should I invest there? Is not always going to be a purely intellectual one. It's going to, intellect will lead you to a door, but then there's something, some, some element of warmth. Like an instinct thing. Where you know somebody, you may... You may feel that somebody's smarter but the other person you can trust more. Trust is not an intellectual thing. Trust comes from 
uh, from, from obviously from experience. Because you can't just, you have to earn trust. But it's definitely in the realm where intellect meets the heart. So there are many ways that we can manifest this idea of cold-bloodedness, hot-bloodedness. But the key thing to remember is that there are consequences. It's not just a game. Because what your attitudes will shape the hell or heaven that you're going to create. So I know people, because of their warmth, have created a real heaven for themselves in this world. People that come to their, their, in their presence always feel warmed by them. So there's a way, of, there's a litmus test for all of this. You know, people you meet, I'm sure you, everybody has their sphere of connections, your networks that you're connected with. And think of it, next time somebody, people that you know well, does that, peop- that person warm your heart or uh, cold? Uh, what's the other extreme? Uh, freezes your heart. And, so, so, uh, we, 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 and it's important to know this because people who warm your heart are people who are give off warmth and exude warmth are people who have a heaven of, uh, of warmth. And people who um, give off uh, the other extreme, which we'll talk about, the fire. Because remember, there's the fire that's also negative, which is anger and so on. Create a hell of fire. And the same is the opposite way. There are people who, cre- who are detached and cold. They create an environment that's like a refrigerator. So yeah, you may get a little cooled off around them. Maybe it's good for a hot day. But you're definitely not going to get inspired. And uh, your heart will not be warm. So I want to wish everybody to have uh, heartwarming experiences this week. Uh, not just this week, all your life. But it's a good time to begin. And... Um, and to look at ourselves, you know, I think that most of us have two, two voices. I don't know who, which one's the dominant one. That comes down to each individual. Some of us are colder. Some of us are warmer. Some people are very cold on the outside. You get to know them. They're very warm. Sometimes the other way around, which I think is worse. Um, you know, very warm on the outside and very cold inside. And that it should be translated into uh, the fact that um, uh, warmth, like light, is a is is attracts cold things repel. You know, for example, um, ice. Once water becomes frozen like ice, so one piece of ice cannot connect with another piece of ice. You let the ice thaw. You let the ice thaw and melt. Then water melts into one, and you can't even tell the difference. So the same two bodies of water could either become like one, or they become like two blocks of ice that are separate. So coldness creates separation and also divisiveness, and basically isolation. That's how it is. And then there's the other end of uh, warming it up. So as I said, may we uh, thaw the cold, even though we're, we're entering in the summer. So I guess it's a good uh, season to um, think about these things. And uh, everyone should have a very, as I said, heartwarming experiences. Meet heartwarming people. Maybe add a few heartwarming people into your list of uh, contacts. And uh, I don't, what to do with the ones that are the other type that you'll decide on your own. And, um, and it should, uh, as I said, uh, it should be a very healthy and growthful week. As I said, it's always an honor to speak to you and share with you. Hopefully, yeah. words from the heart. <coughs> and I want to just make a few announcements in that regard. That firstly, this class is dedicated by um, Susan Reese, in honor of Yosef David Ben Vega. And the next week, we're going to, we have part two of this class, which is going to focus on the hell of fire. And um, I will also announce that on the June 24th, which is a Thursday, there will be a, a, screen, a screening of a film, which is excellent. I saw this film. I recommend it. It's called The Human Experience. Actually, the search of, of uh, the power of the soul's resilience. I mean, it's, a, it's a, like a journey of a few people. It's a real story. Very interesting. I won't, I won't tell you the surprise ending, but uh, it is. Uh, so we'll be screened here on June 24th. I invite you all to it, and we're like hosting it, so to speak. There'll be also like a Q&A with the director and the uh, actors, whoever's in this film. That's on June 24th, and a few other programs that are being uh, announced just in the near future. So keep your eyes open, ears open, and eyes. And um, uh, Philip will not be giving his class tomorrow night, right? No class. And that's not. Okay, he's in Israel, Philip. Um, and uh, we will be here. I'll be here again. I said next Wednesday night. If 
you haven't left your email address, please leave your email address with us so we can stay in touch. Send you my weekly emails, which you can choose to ignore if you like. And uh, as well as announcements about any class events or stuff like that. And please see me and Velvel and the Meaningful Life Center as friends, allies in this uh, common journey called life. Everyone have a very good night and uh, it's a pleasure being here.